If you value the philosophers above Scripture, that's your problem. I accept the Scripture. That is God's standard, not philosophy from Plato. So, he maintained that the apostolic tradition had been preserved and he was defending that tradition. That tradition included his own doctrine that the origin of the tradition of the apostles and the churches is in no respect different from theirs. All the churches are teaching this doctrine that God is embodied. <laughs> Very interesting. He also implied from the beginnings of Christianity to his day that there had been a unified body of Christians who, faithful to the apostolic tradition, they affirmed that God is embodied. Now, Tertullian had a huge advantage over his contemporary Christians. He was educated. He knew the philosopher's stances, and he also knew the scriptures. He was in a position to resist the philosophical intrusions into Christian doctrine in a way that the unlearned Christians could not do. After his conversion, he devoted all of his efforts to a defense of Christianity. That was his life mission, to defend against what Oregon and Clement of Alexandria brought into Christianity from the outside source, Greek metaphysical philosophy from Plato. Tertullian fought that tooth and nail by using the scriptures and the apostolic tradition. And he said, nowhere is this more important than in understanding God is a man, an embodied, glorified, resurrected man, just like his son. He used the son as an example of the father. And then he, he brings in his very, very famous statement. He says, what indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? What between heretics and Christians. Our instruction comes from the porch of Solomon, who had himself taught that the Lord should be sought in simplicity of heart, away with all attempts to produce a mottled Christianity of stoic, platonic, and dialectical composition. And yet it was precisely this stoic, platonic, and dialectic composition that Augustine in the 4th century and later Christians, Ambrose, Bishop Ambrose, brought directly into Christianity and made it the doctrine. Tertullian said, nothing doing. It's a heretical doctrine. It's a false doctrine. The Christian doctrine is the doctrine that we are made in the image and likeness of God's body and soul. And it's all material. That's the true doctrine. That's the biblical doctrine. That is the early Christian doctrine. That was the apostolic doctrine. And there were pockets of this all the way up into the 4th and 5th centuries, even with the monks in the Syrian desert who, who believed in an embodied God when their bishop sent them letters saying, no, no, God is an immaterial spirit. They resisted it. They said, nothing doing. That's the heretic part. That is a heretical teaching. Our teaching is that God is like us, only more glorified and embodied. Paulson goes into great detail on that. During his youth and his early adulthood, Augustine apparently understood that Christians believed God to be embodied. By his own admission, this is the one doctrine that kept him out of Christianity for decades. It's the doctrine that his Christian mother taught him, that the Christians actually believed. Once Bishop Ambrose got a hold of Augustine and said, No, 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 you don't have to understand the scriptures literally. We can use an allegorical spiritual interpretation. Then Augustine could accept Christianity and he became a Christian. Once the doctrine that God had a body was able to be dismissed. That's fascinating, isn't it? He says, oh, he talks a little bit about Augustine. 
And then he says here, with the Stoic and the Manichaean corporealism, and the Christian corporealism, Tertullian had said, nothing is incorporeal except that which is nothing. <laughs> That's a great statement. Nothing is incorporeal except that which is nothing. <laughs> I love that. This belief was for the young Augustine the principal and almost sole cause of my error. He believed in the corporeality. And he called that his error. <laughs> That's how far removed the 4th century Christians had come from the apostolic age. It may be that Tertullian's views on corporeality were prevalent among the African Christians. If Tesca and others are correct, they were prevalent not just among the Africans, but the Western Christians in general because there was simply no spiritual concept of God, and there was no spiritual concept of the soul in the Western Church, outside of a small group of Platonici, that is, a small group of those who had adopted Plato. The Church was completely corporeal in their thinking of divine things, even as late as Augustine's day. That doctrine, Augustine called his error. Once he got rid of it, he could, he could freely become a Christian. But it was not the right kind of Christian. Unfortunately, the apostasy had taken over. The apostasy away from understanding the true kind and nature of God and His Son. Augustine left that for Platonistic philosophy. Then he says, Augustine laughed at the Christians because they believe God has a human form which is the most excellent of its kind. He nonetheless found their belief more allowable and respectable than the Manichaean alternative at one time. He said the uh, Manichaeans were really wild. He joined them for a while, and then he left them. And He was in search of the truth, and then Ambrose comes along and says, Oh, wipe away all the corporeality, and this is the truth. It's all spiritual. It's all incorporeal. And then Augustine jumped on the boat. That's a sad commentary, isn't it? He identified two Christian communities himself who he fought tooth and nail and tried to convince that God is incorporeal and these entire Christian communities was arguing against him because they had the true doctrine and he didn't. But he became more prominent than they did. So they were able to stamp out the Egyptian anthropomorphism as well as the Christian anthropomorphism of a later day in the 4th century. They say that the monks, Cassian, now Cassian, he was a monk and he was an Orientalist, he says he was an incorporealist, but here's what Cassian said. He said he made it clear that for late 4th century Christian monks in Egypt, anthropomorphism was the long established norm and incorporealism was the heretical teaching. That was the innovation. It, it reversed during Augustine's lifetime. But originally, it was corporealism that was believed by the vast amount of Christians. So when we read the early church fathers, we're not necessarily reading a representation of the early Christians. Oregon isn't. He's arguing against them. Tertullian is, but Augustine isn't. He fought against the early Christian doctrine and adapted Plato's philosophy, and he became an incorporealist. But that was not the original Christian teaching. It's not the biblical teaching. So if you think you're reading the original Christian belief by reading Augustine, you're mistaken. You're reading his argument against the original Christian belief. And the, uh, oh, Cassian chronicled the uh, struggle of Serapion, he says, in accepting the view that God is not embodied. Serapion lived a long life. He was at the foremost ranks among the monks, 